High Church, High Tab family, it's Sunday and we are waiting to worship together with you. Let's wave the banners and the flags. Get ready to connect with the Lord this morning. I want you to know this. Remember, no matter what is happening in your world, the Lord is on his throne. That's what Isaiah found. He looked up and he said, hey, God is on the throne. We do not need to worry. So let's Look to the Lord this morning as we connect with Him. Father, we say thank you for bringing us into this online service. And Father, we are here to connect with you. We love you. And no matter what is going on in our world today, we know that you are on the throne. And because you are on the throne, everything will be well in this world. No matter what it looks like, you are on your throne. And we rejoice and we come to bow down to you, to worship you, and Lord, to lift you up the one who's enthroned on high. May your name be exalted, we pray, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Let those emojis go. Amen. Let's worship Him, shall we, church?
Hey church, let's raise a hallelujah. I have something I want to rejoice with you and read to you from the scriptures, from the very book that we are spending time with right now, our series in Joshua. Listen to these wonderful words as I read it from Joshua chapter 23. It says, now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Now, isn't that awesome? As Joshua comes to the end of his life, he says, God has taken care of everything. And we, you and I can say a big amen to that. He has looked after us. He's watched over us. And as we raise a hallelujah, we want to pray for several needs in our church, starting with thanking God for helping our A-level students get through their exams. Shall we pray as we move along through all the other needs as well? Father, we pray, Lord, for our A-level students, thanking you for them and thanking you that you help them make it through to the very end, Father. May your blessing rest upon them and let them get great results, we pray. Father, we pray for COVID-19 and for the curfew to cease, Lord, so that we can come and meet in your house. How we long to be with your people, Father, worshiping you in this awesome sanctuary. Father, we also pray right now for Mano Medha, who needs his sugar level to come to the right normal level in Jesus name we ask that you will touch him father we pray for Teresa Akins Teresa Leroy Akins that your hand of healing will be upon her Lord raise her up lift her up we pray by the power of the blood of the lamb loving father we pray for violin who's weak and she needs a, a boost from you Lord a miracle in her life Touch her for the glory of your precious name. Father, we pray for others who are sick and who are, Lord, recovering. Give them your grace and your strength and bring them through powerfully, we pray. Father, we pray for those who are frustrated without jobs and finding life so difficult during COVID-19. Lord, be their provider. Look after them. Provide jobs even during COVID-19, we pray. Father, we pray for the leaders of our nation that they'll be united, Lord, in working together with all the difficulties that are around us with COVID-19. May your goodness rest upon our nation. Now church, we want to pray for several birthdays in our church. And you know what? We have seven. Let me mention them as we go along and pray for them. Father, we pray for Rani Saku Yogaraja who's celebrating a birthday. Ch Charaka Piris for Shanti Raja Ratnam, Jonathan Homer, Melissa Lienage, Ranjit Watukarage, and Joel Fernando. Father, I pray that your promises will be yes and amen to each of them, that you will grant them the desires of their heart as they put their hope and trust in you. Show them, Lord, that you are the anchor and that you will bring them through the hardest, difficult times and let them know that you are on the throne and everything will be all right. In Jesus' awesome and mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. You guys have been amazing. I mean, I really mean that. You've been so faithful in your giving, and I want to thank you so much. We're going to have the options coming up on the screen. And you know what? If you haven't had the opportunity to give, just follow the prompts on the, on the screen, and then use one of those three methods. And would you give? 
and would you be faithful? Thank you to those who have given so faithfully and so liberally and so cheerfully. You've been an amazing family and I thank you ever so much. May the Lord bless you and open the windows of heaven and bless you abundantly. Thank you, church. Get ready. Get ready for the preaching of God's word. Let's go. Good morning, Tab family, and every one of you that has joined us online today. We are so glad to be able to come from the Tab home into your homes to bring God's Word. We've been so far on an eight-week journey on the book of Joshua in our sermon series called New Beginnings. And last week, you know, Pastor talked about, you know, how gullible we are. And he spoke on three things. He said, don't be gullible in, in regard to the Gibeonite deception. He spoke about making God your go-to person and also so how you can make your mistakes work for you. And today we are on chapter 10 and we want to talk to you from the subject of accelerating under attack. Accelerating under attack and Joshua 10 is our attention this Sunday morning as we come to God's Word and we're going to read from Joshua chapter 10 verses 1 to 14 in a few moments and also verse 40. Two. Let me just give you a background. You know, the Gibeonites have come and made a peace treaty with Joshua, and they have become the servants of the children of Israel to become workers in the tabernacle of God. And you know, the, the kings of Amorites get to know this, and the king of Jerusalem, you know, is threatened by this because the Bible says, as we read in a few moments, that, that Gibeon was a, one of the royal cities. It was a city that was larger and bigger and mightier and greater than the city of Ai, and it says that the, the inhabitants, there were mighty men in the city of Gibeah, and yet for all, you know, they recognize having heard what God has done in the city of Jericho, in the city of Ai, how God has given victory to his people, and, and you know, Gibeon, you know, instead of going to war, they come through deception and make a peace treaty. And Gibeon is an amazing example of those who call on the name of God whenever they are in trouble. And so we're going to read right now in Joshua chapter 10 verses 1 to 14. So would you turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 10. We're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 14 this moment. And this is what Joshua chapter 10 verse 1 to 14 says. Now it came to pass when Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. Therefore, Adonis Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered together and went up. They and all their armies and camped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent Joshua, sent to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly, save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand, not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came up came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel. Killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And it happened as they fled before Israel, were, before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, as, and they died. 
There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. You know, as we said, five kings of the Amorites come against the people of Gibeon, because they have made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel. And Gibeon begins to realize that they are headed towards destruction. They are headed to trouble. And what Gibeon does is what we as God's people have the privilege and the confidence to do. They called upon Joshua to come to their aid and to deliver them when they were coming under attack. Gibeon, though being a great city, a royal city who had mighty men, at this moment when they were under attack, they were arrested with fear and panic. As we look at the world today, we may not have literal armies and people attacking us, but, but the whole world is under attack by the COVID-19 pandemic. And in a sense, as we look at it, we find how people are caught with fear and panic, uh, especially in Sri Lanka. You know, we know that as curfew has been spoken of in the past few weeks and as curfew was put uh, in the past week or so, there was a lot of panic buying. People were panicking and there were a lot of panic buying. Uh, people's livelihood is under attack and many things in a sense, you know, are under attack by an invisible enemy and also there's a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty that people are under. And here's the amazing thing, you know, while the Gibeonites were people who used deception to make a peace treaty, they were a wise people to do so and they were also wise to call on Joshua when they were headed to destruction and when they were headed to trouble. They reminded Joshua and they remembered the covenant they had with Joshua and the people of Israel. Now remember how Pastor shared in chapter 1 how Joshua is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. And the word jo Joshua in the Greek means Jesus and Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua or what we call Joshua today, which means God is salvation. And Gibeonites remind Joshua of the promise that he had made to them as they would become they are servants. In the same way today, in all these unprecedented times of trouble and, and no matter what attack we may come under, I want us to understand that we can run to Jesus because we have a covenant that He has made with us through the shedding of His blood. And we can, we, he has, in Christ, we have secured a promise where Jesus said He will never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us to the very end of the age. And so today, if you feel your life is under attack by, by different things in your life, I I want you to know, when our life is under attack, we can come to Jesus who can deliver us. Because there are two, twice a phrase is repeated in this chapter, in, in verse 42 and in verse 14, and that is this, that the Lord fought for Israel. I want you to know, no matter what battle you may be going through today, I want you to know that our God is a God who fights for us. Amen. He's a God who secures our victory, a God who delivers us from every battle. But here is the PowerPoint I want to leave with you. See, when the people of Israel came, they were coming up against five armies. Till this point, every one of them were taking one city at a time. Jericho, I, you know, and Gibeon, and now, you know, there are five cities and five armies and five nations that were coming against them. In the natural, it's a cause for concern. In the natural, it's a cause for fear. It's a cause for panic. But I want us to know when we belong to God, God has a wonderful way of using the attacks that come upon our life to accelerate us into advancement to lay a hold of God's purpose and God's calling upon our life. Because of the battle that happens and because the Lord fights the battle of his people, the Joshua and the people of Israel no longer had to fight these five cities, you know, one city at a time and one army at a time. In one single day, God gave them victory. And so the PowerPoint I want to leave with you is this. When under attack, don't be arrested with fear and panic, but accelerate with faith in God's 
promises. You know, hold on to God's promises and accelerate and advance in faith because what could have taken a longer time, God did it in a single day. And you know what? God has not changed. He's a God who can do the very same thing in your life and in my life as well. And so I want to share with you three keys as to how you and I can accelerate when we are under attack. How you and I can advance, you know, not get paralyzed, but how we can advance, not get arrested with fear, but how we can advance and accelerate in faith even when we are under attack by enemies and adversities and everything that goes around us. The first thing is found you know, in chapter 10, verse 7. And so the first key in accelerating when we are under attack is this, is to choose the people who will go to battle with you when you are under attack by different forms and types and natures of adversity and adversaries in your life. You got to understand in chapter 10, verse 7, it says that Joshua, the moment the, he heard the, the plea of the Gibeonites, what does Joshua do? Joshua does not go with the priests. He does not go with all the people or the leaders of the tribes of Israel, but this time, you know, he takes men of war and men who were who, men of valor, valiant men he took with him. In other words, Joshua knew in which situation whom he should take. In the battlefield, he knew that was not the place to take the priests. When they were crossing the Jordan, the priests bore the Ark of the Covenant, and there were the leaders of Israel and the army and the people and the representatives of each tribe. But this was a battlefield. And in the battlefield, he did not take any person, any child of God with him, but he took those who have been trained in the art of war, men of war, men of valor, men of courage, who would not look at the odds that are against them and back down and withdraw and get discouraged, but who would march forward with Joshua, with Joshua people who are willing, who has the faith, who has the courage to take on ground and see victory established because God who is by their side and what God has proclaimed. And so I want us to know in our life, you know, the formula for victory victory. The formula for victory is this. The perfect formula for victory in any battle is to have the victorious God for you and valiant men with you. It's not just enough to have the God of victory, the God who is the conqueror, the king of all kings and the lord of all lords for us, but we got to understand that God brings about victory also through people. And so while we have a victorious God who is for us, the Bible says if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen. You know, if you believe God is for you, where you are right now in the comments, begin to type amen and say, God is for me. God is for me. But not only did they have the victorious God with them, who is for them, they were, Joshua had valiant men with him. It's important in our life to recognize something that is very vital as we go to battle, to choose people who will come to go to battle with us when we are going through different situations. See, if we are to walk in victory, we need to know whom to place where and whom to take where. See, even Jesus, who had 12 disciples, did not take all the 12 disciples everywhere he went. There were certain places, certain experiences, certain encounters that he only took James, John, and Peter with him. And other times he would just take Peter with him. Why? Because, you know, it's important based on the situations and the seasons and the moments we are in life to recognize who needs to be there in our life. In moments of decision making, in moments of strategy that is needed, it is important to have people who are counselors in our life. But when it comes to when we are under attack by the enemy, when we are under attack by different adversities, it's important to have people who stay. you know what, we are standing with you, we are fighting with you, and we're going to claim the, the promise of God, we're going to take on the ground that God has promised for you, we will not back down in this battle no matter how the odds may be against us, we are with you, and we're going to go into the battlefield, we're going to lay hold of what God has for us, and so it's important, not just where we place people, but it's important which people we take where we go in order to walk in victory in your life and my life. And that is very, very vital. You find even David had many who followed him, but there were the mighty men of David who went to battle with David and brought about victory, not only in their lives, in their families, but to the nation of Israel. And so you got to understand. So choose people. If you are in a battle, choose people who would stand in the gap with you and pray. Choose people who would speak the promises of God, who will, who will declare the word of God spoken over your life and over your battle so victory can be established and who would be a covering and wage warfare against the enemy. 
Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. In other words, we evolve into whom we hang around with. We evolve into whom we hang around with. You know, when we, are, we hang around and we have people who are men of valor and women of valor and courage and who will not back down, you know what, our faith itself is going to be encouraged. We are also going to become people of courage and confidence because sometimes the reality is this, when we go through battle, we can very easily get discouraged. There can be concern and fear and anxiety that sometimes sets in. But when you have people who are people of valor and people who are confident in God and what God can do, I want you to know, you know, you become encouraged. See, Proverbs is, is, is placed in a portion in the Bible called wisdom literature. And so you have a lot of other parts of the Bible that talks about righteous living, but in the midst of righteous living, the Bible calls us to live well and to live wisely. It's possible to live righteously and yet not live wisely and well in our life. And that's why we have things like Proverbs. And I want us to know that no relationship in our life is ever neutral. Every relationship has a purpose and a place. And we need to learn to put the right people in the right place, not so that bad things won't happen, but that good things can come to happen and we can walk in victory in our life, you know, in your life and my life. Proverbs 27 verse 12 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. We got to understand that we all need people. We all need people to face and go through any adversity in your life and my life. We got to understand either people are pushing us into our future or pulling us back into the past. Either people will push us to our purpose or they will pull us to pain. They will either help us or they will either hurt us. There are no neutral relationships when it comes to the kingdom. And therefore, it's so important, you know, to understand, you know, the people in our life. And, you know, in having the people in life is not just to understand who is in your life, but you need to evaluate who has also sent them in your life. Because not every person that comes to your life is necessarily sent by God. There are people that God sends and there are people that the devil sends. When God sends people into your life and my life, it's always to advance us and for development. When the enemy sends people into our lives, it's always to bring a distraction that ultimately leads to the destruction in our life. And so it's not just important to who is in your life, but important to also understand who has sent you in your life. I remember a time when I was pastoring in Abu Dhabi. I had just gone there about a month and, and you know, we had a lot of newcomers that, that, that kept coming in the singular ministry. In the same time as a lot of new people coming, we just found out during the, week, the, uh, during the weeks to come that the, most of the new people never came back. And so we were a bit concerned. We saw them after our service. There was another singular service. The very new people that came weekly were, were basically, you know, going to this service. So as we begin to pray and seek God, God began to show us how this particular church, which I will not mention, had placed some of their leaders in our service, pretend to be a part of the church that we were pastoring, and to identify new people who were coming and taking them to their service, and some were getting a hold of them and taking them to their service. And I had a chat with their pastor and say, hey, if you need help to reach people, we'll be more than happy to help you with no strings attached, but don't do things like this. So that's why I say, not everyone that is in your life is sent by God necessarily. Sometimes the enemy can send people as well, and we've got to be very cautious and we've got to be very discerning. And I want us to know that we can't carry out the calling of God by just having company with people. We need people who complement us and people who are companions in our life. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, this is what it says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, Adam was actually not alone. Adam had company because Adam had animals. But God said, listen, it's not just enough for Adam to have company. He needs a companion. He needs a helper. And so what God was saying, Adam was, Adam, listen, in order for you to carry out my calling for humanity, it's not enough just to have company. You need to have someone who compliments you and someone who is a companion to you. In other words, God was saying, if my calling upon humanity is to be fulfilled, it cannot be just one gender. There also has to be not just male, but female. I want to suggest to us, when God created Eve, God didn't just create Eve, you know, for Adam to have a wife, but God created Eve so that 
Adam's calling to humanity can be fulfilled by God. And so what really is that Eve was the helper and God created Eve. And so it's important that understand that I can't carry out the calling of God with just having company in my life. I have to have people who are companions and people who will complement me in order that I can carry out God's will for my life and for your life. And so you got to understand, you know, and all you ladies are going to love this. Okay, and I want you to know that, you know, the Bible says this in the book of Proverbs, chapter, 30, uh, ch chapter 18, verse 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So all you ladies who are watching, would you do this? On the comments, would you type or would you turn to your, to your hubby boy or to your dad or, or to your brother and say, I am favor. I am favored because it says that whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, I want us, all of us husbands to recognize something. You know, that means when your wife walked into the room, help turned up. When your wife begins to operate and function in the purpose that God has given, and when she walks into the room, it's never division, but always multiplication. It's, it's never a minus, but always a plus. Amen? Why? Because, you know, and, and you've got to be a person. So all of you husbands, you've got to do this. If you are married and you have a wife, would you type in the comments saying, I am favored by the Lord. In other words, what it means is you've got to look at your wife and say, you know what, honey, I am favored. How much has God loved me? Because I got you and God really has to love me to give you to me. You know who a wife is? A wife is favor on two legs. And so all of you husbands, if you want to join me, do this. You know, when you look at your wife and say, favor, favor, favor. Favor, favor, favor to your wife. Why? Because, you know, and how do you know this favor? There are some people and relationships that are irreplaceable. And those relationships and people that are irreplaceable in your life are expressions of God's favor in your life. Everyone is equally valued, but not everyone adds equal value to our life. And so you've got to find people who add equal value to our life so we can walk in God's purpose and we can walk in what everything that God has prepared for you and for me. So choose people in your life who will go to battle with you so God can fight for you and bring about the victory. The second thing is this. Combat every battle with God's promises. Combat every battle with God's promises. In Joshua chapter 10, verse 8, we find as Joshua prayed to the Lord, it says how the Lord gave Joshua a promise saying, I have already delivered. Notice the past tense. And notice the four verbs that follow in, in verse 10, in chapter 10, verse 10, where, where it says the Lord, you know, routed them. In other words, the Lord caused panic and confusion. The Lord killed them with a great slaughter. The Lord chased them down the road and the Lord struck them. And it says that the Lord fought for Israel that day and gave them victory. All because Joshua got a promise. See, Joshua didn't aimlessly go into battle, but Joshua had a promise that he received from the Lord. And that promise is this, I have delivered them to you. Not a single one of them would be able to stand against you. I want us to recognize this in, you know, as we talk about this. When we are armed with God's promises, we are dangerous and the enemy cannot defeat us. So what he will try to do is to disarm you of God's promises so he can defeat you. When you are armed with God's word and you are armed with God's promises, I want you to know that you are a force to be reckoned with. You are an undefeatable force. You are an undeniable force because God's promise positions you and empowers you you to walk in the victory that God has placed in your life and in my life as well. We experience the benefit of God's power when, when God goes to battle for us as we believe in God's promises. I want you to know that the people of Israel, Joshua, experienced the benefit of God's power. How God gave victory over five nations in one day. What would have taken five battles or five different days or, or a couple of days, God did in a single day. They experienced the benefit of God's power all because God went to battle for them because of the people of Israel and Joshua and this men believed in God's promises. I want you to know, whatever God has promised to you, maybe, you know, your livelihood is under attack, your future is under attack, your marriage is under attack, your finances are under attack. I want you to know, 
call on the name of God, seek God, receive a promise from God's word and begin to, on that promise, begin to act. I want you to know when God has given a promise and he himself has given a sign to you that he is fighting for you and that he will give you the victory. You can count on God. You can bank on God. You can pray that promise in. You can act that promise out and you can cash it in because if God has said it and God has given the sign, God will do it for you. He will bring the breakthrough. He will bring the victory that is needed in your life and my life. And one of the first ways God did that was that he sent hailstones, large hailstones from heaven down on the enemy. Now, this was a real miraculous event. Why? Because as the hailstones came down, the source of the hailstones were God. The size of the hailstone was basically large. And look at the selectivity. It only fell. Everyone was in the battlefield, both the people of Israel, Joshua, and the warriors and the mighty men of Joshua, and the five nations were in the battlefield. But guess at this, the hailstones only fell on the enemy. And I want you to know, it's all because God fought for them. I want us to know God can fight far better than we could ever fight. God is more creative in fighting our battles than we could ever be creative. Sometimes when we try to fight our battles, we get worn out, we get disheartened, we get discouraged. But you have a God whose strength never runs out. And a God who never wears down. And a God who never gets tired out. A God who never taps out. And if you let the Lord fight your battle, believing in the promise that God has given to you, you can see amazing breakthroughs that God brings about in your life and my life, no matter what attack we are under, and he will cause you to accelerate despite the attacks in your life and in my life. And so, this is not about naming and claiming and grabbing, you know, but it's about hearing from God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6 says this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6 says, For he himself has said, notice this, who said first? God himself first said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say. You see, I can only speak what he has said. It's not about naming and claiming and grabbing. It's about receiving a promise of what God has said, receiving the sign what God has said, and then speaking it out, and then you can be rest assured. I can only say what he says. When I say what he says, that's when battles are won. That's when breakthroughs take place. That's when God can turn everything around in in your life and in my life. You know, when that happens, God will take the uh-oh moments and turn them to aha moments. He will take the burdens and turn them to blessings. He will take the battles and turn them into benefits in my life and your life when you and I allow God to fight our battle. And finally, be confident in prayer. Be confident as you pray to God. Be confident. You know, in verse 12, we see how Joshua so confidently prayed to the Lord. It says he cried to the Lord and, you know, he confidently commanded the sun to stand still and the moon to stop. And the Bible says the moment Joshua confidently prayed, what really took place was the sun stopped and the moon, you know, the sun stood still and the moon stopped. Here's what I want you to learn from the life of Joshua. Walk in such a way with God, listening to God, that he will work in such a way, listening to your prayers. When you walk in such a way, listening to God, then he will work in such a way, listening to your prayers. The only reason, the Bible says, on that day, God heeded the voice of a man. The only reason why God heeded the voice of Joshua, because we find from Joshua chapter 1, Joshua was not perfect, but he was a man whose heart was set on listening to God. A man whose heart was set on the word of God. Remember what Joshua 1, 8 to 9 said? You know, God said, be careful to obey all my commandments. Be careful not to turn to the left or the right from it. But, you know, meditate on it daily day and night that you may be prosperous and successful in everything that you do. And so the only reason why God listens to Joshua's prayers was because Joshua listened to God's promises. Joshua listened to God's precepts in his life. And so God listens to the prayer that Joshua says. You know, people may say, you know what? That's not right because, you know, I mean, this, is, this has to do with laws of nature. You know what I believe? I believe there are no such thing called laws of nature, but there are the laws of God that governs every everything in nature. And that's, what, and that's what God did. This miraculous God did not only perform a sign in the heavens by sending hailstones, but he caused the sun to stand still. Now, some people have ridiculed this. Some people have ridiculed this. How can this be? This cannot really be. But I want you to know, ancient you know, cultures and the Chinese, the, the, the Chaldeans, the, the Aztecs and the Incas, they all have writings, ancient writings that record a missing day in history. A missing day in history. Someone, I heard a pastor say, 
say, you know, how a university in Maryland that projects, want to project things 100 years from now and that position satellites, they found, you know, that to be exact, there are 23, there are 23 hours and 20 minutes exactly to be precise that is missing, you know, in time. And actually, if you look at the book of Joshua, it doesn't say a whole day, it says about a whole day about a whole day and so you find you know even the history record of the bible has proven to be so accurate so credible and i want you to know that the chaldean calendar as it projects days forward and our system of calendar that projects looks things backward you know it records that this day you know the chaldean calendar records it to be a 22nd of july you know a tuesday because they project days forward but our system of calendar basically project backwards it says it's about july 22nd a wednesday either way it shows in both sides there's a day about a day that is missing proving to show that this was nothing short of reality and a miracle that's what happens when you and I pray sometimes you know we think oh this is too small for to bring to God or this to bring to too big to bring to God but you know Joshua was a man who prayed passionately and presumptuously boldly and confidently and as a result you know what there was a day that was extended for them to contend in battle to fight in battle and the victory was established. This is the God that you and I worship and we serve. When you and I pray in confidence with God, in confidence in God, when we pray to God, God is a God who would move the heavens. God is a God who would make changes in whatever has to be made. He will alter the laws that are out there in regard to nature by His laws and He will give you the victory. This God has not changed. He's still the God who fights for you and still the God who fights for me. Let me close with a with a quote and an illustration, and we're going to pray that whatever battles you're going through, that God would turn it around and God would give you and me the victory that is needed in your life and in my life as well. The famous hymn writer John Newton in another, we, we all know the hymn Amazing Grace, but he wrote another amazing hymn called Come My Soul, Thy Suit Prepare. And it goes on to say this, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power is as such, none can ever ask too much. None can ever ask too much. There is never a time we can ask too much of a great, mighty, big God. Let me close with this story. There was a lady named Louis Redden, a poorly dressed lady with a look of defeat on her face, who had an ill husband and seven children, and they were in a financial crisis. And this lady, you know, walked into a grocery store, and she approached the owner of the store, uh, you know, in, in a most humble manner, and asked if he would let her charge a few groceries. She softly explained that her husband was very ill and unable to work. They had seven children, and they needed food. John Longhouse, the owner of the, the grocery store, laughed at her and requested that she leaves his store immediately. Visualizing the family need, she said, please, sir, I will bring you the money just as soon as I can, but would you please give me some groceries? John told her he could not give her credit as she did not have a charge or credit account to charge in the store for. Standing beside the counter was another customer who overheard the conversation between this lady and the owner of the store. And he walked up to the, to the grocery owner and he, he said, you know, that he is good to stand on behalf of her to pay whatever the cost of her grocery list really is. And so the grocer said in a very reluctant voice, do you have your grocery list? And so this lady, Louis, replied, said, yes, sir. He said, put your grocery list in the scales and whatever your grocery list weighs, I will give you that amount in groceries. And so, so he said, you know, you put the groceries in the scales and whatever that scale, the grocery list weighs, that amount he will give in groceries. And so Louis hesitated for a moment with a bowed head. Then she reached into a purse and took out a piece of paper and scribbled something on it. She then laid the piece of paper on the scale carefully with her head still bowed. The eyes of the grocer and the customer showed amazement when the scales went down and stayed down. The grocer starting, staring at the scales turned slowly to the customer and said begrudgingly, I can't believe it. The customer smiled and the grocer started putting the groceries on the other side of the scales and the scale did not balance. So he could to put more groceries and more groceries and more groceries till the scales could hold no longer anymore. And the grocer stood there in utter disgust. Finally, he grabbed the piece of paper from the scales and looked at it with great amazement. It was not a grocery list. It was a prayer which said, 
Dear Lord, you know my needs, and I am leaving this in your hands. The grocer gave her the groceries that he had gathered and placed on the scales and stood in stunned silence. Louis thanked him and left the store. The customer handed a fifty dollar bill to the to the grocery store owner and said it was worth every penny of it. It was only some time later that John Longhouse discovered the scales had been broken before, and therefore only God knows how much a prayer weighs. When you pray in confidence, there's nothing that's impossible to God. So let us pray. I want to encourage you. You can accelerate under attack. Choose the people who will do battle with you for your healing, for your financial breakthrough, for your marriage, for your family. Choose people who will stand with you and battle with you for God's promise. Combat every battle with God's promises in mind and speaking God's promises into the battle that you are in. And confidently pray knowing the God who made the sun to stand still is a God who can lengthen the days for you and cause things to stand still even in your life. Amen. Shall we pray? Hallelujah. Right now, if you are going, if you feel that your life is under attack wherever you are, would you in your comments begin to write saying, you know, under attack, under attack. You don't have to say what you are under attack on, but you can say under attack. And I want you to know that as you do that, we're going to remember that we're going to keep praying for you during the week because we want you know, we want to stand with you as those valiant men and men of war stood with Joshua on behalf of Gibeon. We want to stand with you and pray that under this attack that you will accelerate and you will see the Lord fight for you and the Lord will give you victory. Hallelujah. So where you are, hallelujah, say, God, drop in people in my mind that I could call today to stand with me as I make you my number one go-to person. There'll be people around me, people of grit, people of guts who will stand with me and battle with me, standing in the gap in prayer and in the word of God. Ask God to place people in your mind right now. People who will journey with you in prayer. People who journey with you in the word of God. Hallelujah. Secondly, hallelujah, just where you are, remind yourself of the promises of God. Remind what he has said so you may boldly say what he has said into your situation, what he has said into your battle, what he has said into your problem so that you can see the victory in your life life and my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right now, hallelujah, where you are, confidently begin to lift up those promises to God and say, God, you who caused the, the sun to stand still and the moon to stop is a God, hallelujah, who will fight for me. The God who will give me the victory. So, Father, we pray whatever the attacks of the enemy, it doesn't matter how the odds are against your people. You are the God who fights for us. You are the God who can turn every hallelujah, every loss set back into a breakthrough of God. And so, Father, I pray that your people will see how you will fight for them in their family, in their finances, in their future and every detail of their life you will fight for them and God we pray your victory would be established and people will see the display of your power oh God and we pray that you would turn that attack into acceleration and advancement so we can carry out your calling and step into your promises for the glory of your name in Jesus name and all God's people say Amen Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Where you are, just worship the Lord. Just worship the Lord.
our God is a God who will always fight for us. And no matter what we go through, we can always go through Him in prayer. And He's a God who will fight on our behalf. Church, thank you so much for joining us uh, on our online service. We just hope and pray that you'll have a blessed week ahead. Stay safe and God bless you all.